Welcome, everybody. Everybody have a good lunch? You get enough to eat? Good. We'll give them a couple more minutes to get here, and then we'll get started. I'll play until everybody gets here. Larry Sire. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. You spell it S E Y E R, and you can find out more about me at LarrySire.com. LarrySire.com. I have been working with David since 2005. I first heard about him on the Art Bell Show, Coast to Coast. How many people listen to that show? Almost everybody in the room. I was listening one day, and I didn't have any idea who he was. And I'm one of these people that listens to intuition, just basically follows intuition, and even if it doesn't make sense, I follow it. Even though my thinking mind may say, wow, that doesn't make any logical sense to do that, I just follow intu intuition. So as I was listening to the radio program, uh, a prompt, I call these things prompts when you get an intuitive hit. A prompt said, call this guy and book an appointment. At the time, he was booking appointments, taking personal readings. This was 2004. And so I called him and made an appointment, and it wasn't until January of 2005 that I was able to get in and talk to him. So January comes, we have our appointment, and it's a phone conversation, and he's doing the reading, and quite honestly, I wasn't paying too much attention. I was just listening, but not too intently. And at the end of the reading, uh, he wanted to know more about me, and I told him what I did for a living. I am a music producer, and I've been doing that full-time for 35 years. I, I've actually been recording and uh, doing music production since 1971, which is like 42 years, but full-time since 1978 been a musician all my life, been playing since I was four years old. I'm 61, so over 50 years I've been playing. Matter of fact, I, I like to say that music or playing guitar or keyboards for me is as natural as talking. So if you can imagine, you know, you're, you're talking, you're not thinking about your lips or your teeth or what your tongue are doing, is doing. That's, that's the way it is for me on the guitar or piano. I don't have to think about it anymore. It's just as natural as walking. So, whenever we had the conversation and we were talking at the end, I was telling him that I was a music producer. And, um, and he said, oh, he was a musician also. He, I don't know, if, how many people know David plays drums? Okay, several of you, all right. He's a very good musician, by the way. And he sings and he plays drums. And he's uh, pl learning guitar right now, is what he's doing, he's playing guitar. So we were talking at the end, and uh, I got another prompt. It says, tell him about your awards. And uh, so I did. I, I've, over the course 
of my career on 35 years, I've won nine Grammy Awards. So, thank you. Thank you. Worked with a lot of big names in the industry. I could name a few. They're all listed on my website if you want. Not all of them. Several are listed on my website, LarrySire.com. Uh, I'll just name a few. Um, all the awards were won with working with a group called Asleep at the Wheel. Who's heard of, you've heard of Asleep at the Wheel? Okay, I did all of the records for Asleep at the Wheel from 1986 to uh, 2007. So during that time, they won several awards and, of course, you work with them, you get the award too. So that's what I did. And my, my capacity for, for working with them was uh, mainly engineering, but it was also playing guitar and musician and remix engineer. So the Grammys were for engineering, remix engineer, and musician. So several different categories. So very fortunate to work with uh, people like Lyle Lovett, um, Sean Colvin, Manhattan Transfer, Garth Brooks, George Strait, Dolly Parton, uh, George Martin from the Beatles. Um, the, I'm forgetting many, but it was, a, it was a, a fun thing to do. So at the end of our conversation, I just mentioned that, that I have nine Grammys and because I got the prompt to tell him about it. So he said, oh, well. I, I, his ears per perked up, and he got also all of a sudden excited. I said, "Well, okay, great." And we started talking about musical things. He was telling me about you know how long he's been playing drums and writing songs, and so we had a little mu musical moment there. And during the musical moment, I got another prompt and said, "Just tell him we're going to do a project together." Okay. So I did. I just mentioned that, uh, okay, it feels like we're going to do a project together. Now, little did I know that everybody and their brother tells David this. <laughs> we're going to do a project together. <laughs> I, I had no idea. So I mentioned it. But he, his response was, instead of everybody tells me that, he said, it feels right. I think we are. And so he booked a plane ticket to our house in Austin. We live in Austin. Carlin and my, I live in Austin. We've been there since 94, 93, somewhere around there. So he spent 14 days with us in Austin in 2005, February 2005. And that's how I met him. During those 14 days, we recorded what became the Science of Peace. How many people have the Science of Peace? Do you even know what it is? Okay, all right. Well, it's the first thing we did together. It's a three-hour uh, talk with scored music underneath the talk. And so David and I wrote and produced the music together for that product. It's available on divinecosmos.com, obviously. But we did that, and in February, after we recorded it, we, we were thinking, well, <clears throat> we're just going to wait. Some, some big production company is going to contact us. They're going to offer us the deal, and we'll sell it, and... You know, how, you know how naive you can get sometimes. You know, you're thinking, oh, we're gonna, we've got this great thing and somebody's going to contact us and they're going to give us a bunch of money and they're going to distribute it. Well, in reality, nothing happened. For two years, nothing happened. In that time, in two years, um, I also am the webmaster. I do the website. Uh, I, I basically took over the, ma the management of all of his website. So in 2005 through 2007, I just did website stuff for David. Okay, after two years, nothing happened with the project. It just sat in our living room, literally, CDs in the living room with nothing going on. And in February of 2007, I got the prompt that call David and put it out yourself. Okay. <laughs> So we did. I called him. In February 2007, we started selling the Science of Peace online as our first product to sell. Now, I'm telling you this because this is how David and I got to know each other and how we're working together. Now, since the Science of Peace, we've done many other projects. We've done uh, Wander Awakening. Who, peop who knows about Wander Awakening? Okay, several. It's a 50-song it's a musical that describes the story of a wanderer who's a spirit who incarnates into the physical, has a bunch of problems, and then through the, through the growth and through the problems, he learns forgiveness and returns back to spirit world. So it's a complete cycle. 
It's 50 songs that tells this two and a half hour musical that tells a story. That's what, another product. Access Your Higher Self. Okay, Access Your Higher Self is like a three hour or four hour video describing how to get in touch with your higher self. It's also available on the website. So we, we, I tell you this not to sell products. I'm just trying to tell you that we've done many things together. And what, the reason I am here today, and his, his mother Marta and my wife Carla, is that David used to do conferences at other locations where he did not put them on. And there was issues getting... Um, reimbursed for his time <laughs> sometimes. So he and I uh, then decided with Marta to put on these conferences uh, ourselves. And this is now the 25th conference we put on together. Thank okay. you. Oh, my, it's my pleasure. We, we love it. My, my wife and I go to all these conferences, and now that she's retired, she always goes to these conferences, and we, we consider it's like a little vacation, because we, we, we get to go meet all these great people and do these things, and see, we were just in Hawaii in February, and uh, we actually added two weeks on both sides of the conference, so we were there a month. Uh, yay, thank you. We, we loved Hawaii, oh my goodness, I fell in love with Hawaii. This is the second time for being there, for putting on a conference there. We were there last February for nine days, and that wasn't enough, so we came back in February and we did uh, a whole month. And, and now, I'm, I will make the announcement, Carla and I are actually considering moving there, because yeah. yeah, we, we love it, absolutely love it. So, it, it, was, it was a small turnout, but it was just the right number. And yeah, we, we find that we have anywhere from, I guess the smallest conference we had was a little under 40, and the biggest was 180, 190, somewhere around there. So they, they vary in size, but it's always the right number of people. You know, David believes, and I believe also, that everything happens for a reason, and it's, everything is perfect. Each one of you are here for a reason. There is a reason you are here. You got the call to be here, and you are going to learn, and you are learning exactly what you need to learn for being here. Yes. There's going to be thoughts and concepts and ideas and memories that are triggered in you that will affect the rest of your life from this weekend. Yes, so it's a celebration because this is, this is really fun stuff. So I have sort of a, an outline I'm following today. That's why I'm looking at my phone. Yeah, you'll go ahead, Wanda. Just a curiosity, are, are you the moderator of the website? No, the no, those are volunteers. Uh, I always feel sorry for him because he gets Oh, there's several of them. You know, they, 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 they yeah, they, uh, no, that, that's, that's, a, that's too much work. No. It actually, it, it's a lot of work just maintaining the website and make sure it stays up. How many people remember when it, uh, the hackers took us down? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was a fun time. Yeah, not. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. That, that, um, that's, that's a result of switching to a newer version of the software that runs the website. David and I have been using the older version for, well, for years, I guess since 08 or 09, whatever. And they came out with a newer version. But it's, as you know, there are thousands of articles on David's website. And whenever you update to a newer version of software, it's not pushing a button and it's just done. <laughs> no, no. It takes weeks worth of time uh, transitioning the old material or the old uh, software into the new software. So one of the results of, of uh, going to the new version of the software is being able to get something better in the comments. Thank you, Barry, I appreciate that. We really appreciate the, the feedback that you all provide to us because feedback from you tells us that we're either doing it right or we're doing it wrong or we need to improve here or improve there. So we absolutely appreciate your feedback and your comments. And thank you. And also making comments on the website helps drive other traffic to David's site and the word gets out. So just an FYI. All right. What the discussion today is going to be, and by the way, this is going to be interactive. This is not Larry saying this is the way it is and you all just listen. This is going to be talk. 
okay, between you and me. And you can, an you can ask questions. I will answer them if I know the answers. Yes, sir? Well, I would have to say that you're psychic because that's exactly the next topic on my, my phone. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Yeah, that's all right. That's okay. I think that's good. I come from a strict German Catholic background. Okay, I was raised German Catholic. Let me tell you how strict it was. My mother was in the convent to become a nun and got sick and went home and met, met my father and married him. My father has two sisters who are nuns, a cousin who's a priest, and his sisters, two sisters were nuns. We come from a town of 1,100 people. Actually, my wife and I are both from the same little hometown in Oran, Missouri, a little southeast Missouri. You know where that is? Yeah, just south of Cape Girardeau. Yeah, you know where that is? And, but here's the interesting thing. Oran has the largest German Catholic church between St. Louis and Memphis. So that's the town we grew up in. Very heavily strict German Catholic. Well, obviously I'm not, I'm a recovering Catholic now. <laughs> so, thank you. I tell you this uh, just as, as background for my spiritual training and how David and I have aligned spiritually and also business-wise and musically and, and what have you and why I'm here. So this all ties into the same thing. As I grew up, I realized that traditional religion, and I'll just, I'll lump all religions, traditional religions in the same category, even though probably some of them could be exempt. I'll say Catholicism, baptism. Uh, they have a model where the Savior is something other than yourself, and it's non-attainable, and you are guilty. You are guilty, something else is your savior, and you must rely on that other person, and he is special, and you will never be that. Okay? How many people are raised? I was raised this way. Anybody else raised this way? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that's okay. If it works for you, if you want to believe that, and that works for you... I, God bless you. Go for it. That is wonderful. It didn't work for me. So I went through a period where I rejected all religion. And something in me said, it's bullshit. And I said, okay, I cannot live. I cannot practice this bullshit. You know, so I let it go. Now, even though my parents are still strict German Catholics and they're very devout Catholics, I respect them. I'm so happy it works for them. It just doesn't work for me. So I left it. And I went through a period where I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in anything. I think, I think that's actually a natural progression to go. When, when you're indoctrinated into a belief system, you must reject everything first before there's a room for truth to fill in. Uh, well, whatever. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm not going to touch that topic. <laughs> he said go from Republican to a Democrat, but I'm, I'm going to let that go. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, I'm actually on the same page with you then. He was saying they're both lies. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> yeah, pendulum swing. So before I even heard of David Wilcock, and I, and I think he was probably in grade school, I don't know how old, let's see, I don't know what he, how, how old he was in the mid-80s. But in the mid-80s, I started doing a, a truth-seeking thing, finding out what's, what is truth. And I didn't know. I was just, since I had rejected everything I was taught, and I was open to truth filling in the blank space that I had, things started coming to me. And one of the first things that came to me was a book by Garudas, Garudas wrote a book called Gem Elixirs and Vibrational Healing, which was a book that um, talked about crystals and rocks and how their resonances helped the body heal. That's about as far away from Catholicism as you can get. But 
it made sense to me. And for some reason, I, I studied that book for a, a while, and then somebody saw uh, that I was reading this and said, well, do you know about Edgar Cayce? And I said, no. And honestly, I, didn't, I never heard of him. I didn't know who he was. Um, I had no reason to, to research him or, or look anything about him. So they said, well, you need to read There is a River. And so I bought the book, There's a River, read that, and then it, that brought me to read the story of Atlantis, the story of Jesus. The, you know, the, there's a whole series of Edgar Casey books. How many people have read the Edgar Casey books? Okay. So still not knowing anything about David Wilcock or anything. But it was a primer. It was, it was a primer. Now, I told you before that I, um, I'm a producer, a music producer, and I work with lots of different groups, and... I'm fairly successful, successful doing this. They, sometimes they would want to do something for me because they're happy with their project. Well, I was working with uh, a couple girls and we produced, I produced a record for them and they were happy about how the project turned out and they wanted to cook me spaghetti dinner. So I don't normally do that, but something in me said, okay, go to spaghetti dinner. Okay, all right, all right. So, Went to their house and they cooked me a very nice spaghetti dinner. And it was just, you know, it's very simple. And at the end of the meal, they took the plate away from me and then slammed a book on the, on the table and said, you have to read this. <laughs> okay, all right. So I took the book and I started thumbing, thumbing through it and I will say, well, that, that resonates as true to me. That feels like it's true. And every page that I opened, it seemed to be truth. And when I opened the first page, and you know, I was thumbing through it, and I finally got back to the first page, I read, this is a course in miracles. It's a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can choose the curriculum. It only means you can choose what you're going to take at a particular time. That's the opening to A Course in Miracles. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. It's like, this is it. That was the reason I had spaghetti dinner with these two people. I had, I had to get introduced to this book. This is 1986. Uh, October of 19... Oh, take it back. Not 86, 88. October of 1988. And so that became my spiritual teaching from that point on. It still is today, which is... Um, I, I, I've expanded my range from the Course into other things to include the Law of One, to include NTI. How many people have earned NTI? Nobody ever heard of NTI? Oh, boy. That's, we don't have enough time to get into that, but... the. the NTI is actually an acronym for a shortcut. Here's the, here's the real official title of the book. The Holy Spirit's Interpretation of the New Testament. Channeled book that reinterprets the New Testament. It's an amazing work. If, you, if you're interested in, in expanding your, your knowledge or your spiritual awareness, I highly recommend it. New Testament Interpretations. NTI. Everybody calls it NTI, but the official title is The Holy Spirit's Interpretation of New Testament. The author, well, the scribe, not the author, the scribe is Regina Dawn Akers. But just like A Course in Miracles, the author is not the person who wrote the letter down, the, the words down. She was a scribe. How many people know what A Course in Miracles is? About half the room. Okay. I will take a brief description of what it is and what, how it came about, but I won't get too deep into it. Basically, there was an atheist in the 60s at the Columbia University of College of Physicians, okay, in New York. This is an atheist working at a college that teaches other psych psychotherapists how to think, okay? She's about as far removed from Jesus and God as there is. In fact, she teaches students that if you hear a voice, you're crazy, okay? That's what she teaches. While she was teaching, 
she started hearing a voice. <laughs> and the voice said, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. It scared her to death. Her name was Helen Shuckman. I'll shorten the story just a little bit. Basically, her and a friend then agreed to meet after school hours and after work hours, and the voice would come and she would scribe it down in, in shorthand, and then her friend Bill Tetford would copy or type out, typewritten notes, the shorthand into these pages. This went on for seven years. Seven years. And it eventually became and was published as A Course in Miracles. What A Course in Miracles is, is three books in one. There's the text, there's the workbook, and there's the manual for teacher. And the, really, the one that's really important is the workbook. Because it doesn't matter if you understand anything about it, because there's a lot of crap in there that you read. I, I remember when I first started reading it, I read a, a paragraph, and I'd, I'd read it three or four times, and I'd be staring at it and say, I have no idea what I read. <laughs> I have no idea. Because it uses terminology and words, and you go, that makes no sense. Now, if you do the workbook, and it's just one lesson per day, for 365 days, one year long course, that's all it is. All you have to do is do the lessons, like it says, you don't even have to understand it, you just do it, like five minutes a day. By the end of the workbook, you understand. The whole idea of the workbook is for you to hear the voice directly, for you to get intuition directly. That's the whole purpose of the course. And then it says, once you hear the voice, throw the book away. Throw it away, you don't need it. You don't, you don't need the church. You don't need an interpreter. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pope. Each one of us can hear the voice of God, or if you don't want to call it God, we can hear the voice of everything directly. Now, the, the next question that you may have that I had was, how come we don't hear the voice? Why did I need a course to hear the voice? Why don't I hear the voice right now? Okay, if, if I can, if I have that ability, why don't I hear it right now? Well, that's what I want to share with you today. Yes, sir. No, there absolutely was editing done. Yeah, I know for sure there was. Because I have, I actually have a copy of the original scribed text. It, it's, no, it's actually, it, I've got an electronic form. And I read, there was absolutely editing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I, I, there wasn't that kind of editing going on, uh, not to my awareness. There, the kind of editing that was on was there was personal messages to Helen. There was conflicts between Helen and her associate Bill, and there was fighting going on, a lot of tension. And so there were personal messages to her that, relect, that, that related directly to her and Bill that they took out of the finished version. They took out the personal things. There's a couple other things that built that uh, that I believe that the editor took out that should not have been taken out. And there were, and but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if you do the work, but you, you just you'll, you'll know the truth. You, no, don't worry about that because it didn't affect the meaning or the the purpose of the course. And she had some she had some issues because in the course there's a lot of Christian terminology. And uh, it really turned her off. Like, I don't want to hear. And by the way, just in case y'all are interested, y'all, I'm actually Texan now. Yeah. Actually, yeah. <laughs> the author of A Course in Miracles is Jesus. In case, let, there's no question about it. The author was Jesus. He makes several references to when I was on the cross and I said this, this is what I meant. And he goes in detail about that. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, great. Anyway, that's what got me back on the spiritual path, or on the spiritual path, was A Course in Miracles. What the Course does, and what, well, and it's not the Course in Miracles, it's a Course in Miracles, because, you know, there's thousands of ways. There's a hundred ways that you can become intuitive or hear the voice. What the Course did for me was allow me to 
learn or remember the difference between thinking and intuition. And I want to point out something that maybe you all are not aware of or you've forgotten. Thinking, all thinking is judgment. Every bit of it. Every bit of thinking is judgment. Thinking always happens outside of the now. It's either worried about the future or regret for the past. Thinking is always about one of those things. Intuition, on the other hand, is always only in the now. It's never, ever worried about the future. It's never, ever worried about the past. N intuition is always the now. It's outside of time. And just, I just want to point that out. Thinking is about anything other than now, and intuition is only the now. And the trick is to know which voice you're listening to. We, that, that's the trick, because we get caught up in, we get a prompt, and we'll say, is that the right thing to do? I'm not sure. When the prompt comes in, like one of the things that, that I'm dealing with directly right now is I got the prompt to move to Hawaii. But after I got the prompt, like, oh my goodness, I've been in Austin 35 years. My wife, all my kids and my grandkids are here. Oh, is this the right thing to do? And all of a sudden, this thinking comes in. You're worried about the future. You're thinking about all of the past you have with all your kids and, and everything. And so all this thinking is loud, clouding the intuition. But the intuition was absolutely clear. Move to Hawaii. Okay. Yeah, twist my arm. So I, I shared this with you because it's personally relevant to what we're talking about right now. And also to explain that there is a difference between thinking and intuition. All thinking is judgment. All thinking is judgment. And some people won't accept that. Some people say, that's not true. I can think without judging. I would say that if you're thinking without judging, you're actually listening to intuition. I've gone too long without playing. I'm going to play something. So we started out talking about, yes, sir. 
first of all, your music really clears the mind. It's really gorgeous. Oh, thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you and David do anything with solfeggio tunes. You know, we get that question a lot, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that we've already been, I've been down that road, the different tunings. He's asking about tunings. As you know, um, in the 1920s, the Musicians Union decided that A was, A is like this note. The A was going to be 440 cycles per second. That means that the string or whatever instrument you're playing is going to vibrate back and forth 440 times per second, and that determines the pitch. Okay, they chose that number because it was a nice round number. But in truth, A, if you're going to use the true A, is actually up to, for debate. Some people say it's 444, some of them say it's 416, some of them say 432. The, the debate for about 432 seems to be the, the A that resonates with most of the objects on the planet. 432 for A, but there's all kinds of problems if you choose, if you change your tuning from 440 to 432, especially with acoustic pianos and some acoustic instruments, because the instrument itself was designed to be at 440, and if you tune a piano to 432, it's liable to turn it into a pile of crap, because the, the tensions are not right. So get back to your question, answer yourself, yes, I've done extensive experiment with that. As a matter of fact, I've done a complete record at 432. But here's what I say to that. Screw that. Do everything at 440. And then get you an app you can get for your iPhone, and you can play any tune at any frequency you want. There's an app called the Amazing Slowdowner, and there's other apps that will take all your music library and it'll play it back at 444, or it'll play it back at 432, or 416, or 440. So there's an app for your iPhone that'll to play all traditional music in the pitch that you choose. So that's my answer to that. The Amazing Slowdowner is on the iPhone. There's also another one. Uh, let me see if I can bring it up here and I can get you the. The name. The reason that I asked about it, um, Larry, was because what I was reading, and it was, it, I was just recently turned on to that whole mm -hmm. scale. Yeah. Um, they were saying that, uh, and I believe they even use like 528. Like well, C. They're probably talking about C. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. Well, let's talk about that, though. What does healing? No, it's not something outside of yourself. It's not something outside of yourself. You, you've, been, you've been programmed. You've been programmed to believe that something outside of yourself is going to save you. And that is really what we're talking about here. We're talking about... Before you want, I'll go any farther, I want to let you know the name of that program. The other one is Any Time, Any Tune Pro, A N Y T U N E Pro. Any Tune Pro so will take any song and play it back any frequency you want. All right, getting back to where we are. Let's get back to this. The traditional religious model, okay, you're going to see the correlation here, is that there's only one Savior, it's not you. Jesus is an exception, not the rule. We're guilty at birth. Christ consciousness is not attainable because we are un unworthy. The only way we can attain nirvana or get to heaven or re be redeemed is from somebody else doing something for us. We've been programmed, okay? All religions program that into us. It's bullcrap. It's bullcrap. You are not saved by some frequency outside of you. You're not saved by, by A432. You're not saved by some resonance outside of you. You are saved by the fact that you are perfect the way you are right now. You are completely, wholly perfect right now, without exception. Thank you. I'm just stating the truth. You may believe you are guilty, and I would say that most of us 
believe that we are guilty in some, some form or fashion, but that's a lie. It's a complete and total fabricated lie. You're completely innocent, without exception. Getting back to traditional religious teachings, it's a pyramidal power structure. Where have we seen the pyramid before this weekend? It's a pyramidal power structure. You got the Pope, you got the Cardinals, you got these other priests, and then you're way down here in the peons. You're on the peons. And they are in charge, and they determine how you're going to get to heaven and how you're going to... That's bullshit. I'm sorry. In my opinion. I'm, I'm just sharing my opinion here. <laughs> Okay, but it, it really, I mean, that's their model. Their model is something else is going to save you. All right. It's a duality model. Duality, does everybody know what I mean by duality? Okay, there, there is an us and a them. There is a me and a you. There is a something else, and then there's me. Okay, now I want to compare that to the, I call it, uh, unapologetically, I call it the truth model, but... You can call it anything you want. This is a different model. We'll call this spiritual model, whatever. Non-religious spiritual model. Okay, here, con contrast this to the other one. You are the Savior. Jesus is our brother. And matter of fact, you can find quotes in the Bible. David even quoted one from the Bible. He said, of these things you will do and greater. Remember that? We are completely innocent. Christ consciousness is the goal. It's a pure non-dualistic model. In other words, it's not an us and them, me and you, we're win or lose. It is a oneness model. And this is the, the combination, or this is what is in common with the Course in Miracles and the Law of One. Both of these teachings say the following. There is only one of us here. There's only one of us here. Now, this may be hard to grasp because it sure seems like there's a bunch of us in this room. It sure seems like there's a me and there's a you. It sure feels like it. But when you go into and your thinking or your consciousness and you start asking questions like the following, who is it that is thinking? Who is the one that's doing the thinking? You start chipping away at this framework that makes it appear as if there are many of us in the room, but in reality, there's one. There's one mind, there's one Son of God. That's one thing is, is true in, in the Bible, in, in my learning anyway, is that there is one Son of God. It happens to be all of us, collectively. We're all the Son of God. And I say son, I could say daughter, I could say whatever. I'm, there's really no sex with it. It's just, there's only oneness. Now in oneness, notice the oneness teaching is everything. And it's synonymous with God. When I say God, you can substitute God for the word everything. Now if you are everything, what separates everything into individual parts? Anybody? Okay. Got thoughts, language. Anybody else? Yes, sir? I couldn't hear you that. Space. Okay. Perception. Would you agree that what separates everything into individual pieces is judgment? You must judge something to be different from something else to have two-ness. Now notice that I'm, I'm trying to set up a, a model here. In two-ness, our duality, it's full of judgment. There is a right and a wrong. There's a left and a right. There's an up and a down. There's a hot and a cold. There is a me and there's a you. Okay, that's two-ness. Now, in oneness, which is the other model I'm presenting to you, in the oneness, it's, which is everything, we are all the same. We are the one. And, but notice that in this model, there is no judgment. In this, remember I said before that all thinking is judgment. In this model, there's no thinking. There's a knowingness. There's a oneness. There's an awareness. There's intuition. 
There's absolutely consciousness, but there's no thinking, there's no judgment going on because it's a recognition that everything is one. There's a sameness. There's a sameness. So how do you get from living a life where you absolutely are convinced that you and there, that you, there's a you and there's something else and there's a right and a wrong and left and right and up and down. How do you get from that thinking? And if you, do you remember what David said uh, earlier? I think it was today he was talking about you must move past the point where there's a right and a wrong. There's a dark and there's a light. There is a black and there's a darkness. There's, there's duality. Remember, that's duality. You must get past that point. The only way you can get past that point is to give up that's true, but what is ego? Judgment. Ego is judgment. Is the judgment that there is a me and a you. The judgment there is a right and a wrong. The judgment, all judgment. To get to oneness, you must get to the place of accepting everything as it is without wanting anything to change, which is that forgiveness. The Course Miracles spends chapters upon chapters talking about forgiveness. Now, I think I need to point out that when I say the word forgiveness, I'm not talking about what typical religions talk about forgiveness. Typical religions say that forgiveness is this. You did something wrong, but because I'm so good, I'm gonna let it slide. <laughs> That's typical religious forgiveness, right? I mean, who did not, who, who doesn't understand that? Everybody gets that. You did something wrong, but because I'm good, I'm gonna let that slide. I'm gonna let it go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let it go. That's still judgment, my friends. I'll forgive you this time, that's right. That's still judgment. It's just hidden within the word forgiveness. The kind of forgiveness that I'm talking about is the recognition that everyone, without exception, is wholly and completely innocent. They've never done anything wrong. They never will do anything wrong. They are just perfect as they are. Which is another way to say, I'm accepting everything as it is without wanting anything to change. That's the kind of forgiveness I'm talking about. Forgiveness and acceptance are exactly the same thing in my definition of forgiveness, and in a non-dualistic term here. Now, the question that always comes up at these conferences, every time I'm gonna beat you to it, yay, for the first time. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> Is, does that mean when you see a baby being raped, you should not do anything about it? Does that mean that when you see something is obviously wrong, you should let it slide? Does that mean you need to accept the Illuminati? Does that mean you need to accept everything? I mean, accepting everything as it is seems like, wow, that means I'm gonna let a lot of shit go by. <laughs> it always comes up. I beat you, I'm so glad. <laughs> uh, he was thinking, he was, it was on the tip of his tongue. You were gonna go there. You were gonna go there. Oh, you did? Okay. All right. All right. Let me address that. Okay. <laughs> so where, where you go from this is back what we were talking about 30 minutes ago. Knowing the difference between thinking and intuition. If your intuition says, get involved and save that baby, absolutely do it. If your intuition is saying, you need to take up guns against the Illuminati, absolutely do it. But if you're thinking about it, you're in a world hurt. If you're thinking, you're confused because the thinking is the realm of judgment of what might be and what was. It's not relevant to what is. Thinking is always about what will be or what was. I want to share something. How many people have heard of the remote viewing program? Quite a few in this room. Okay, remote viewing. What is the first thing they teach you in remote viewing? Bingo. 
what's the first thing they teach you? Non-judgment, but they also teach you to write the first thing that comes in your mind. Do not analyze it. Do not analyze it at all. If you get a picture of a bird upside down, write a picture of a bird upside down. If you get a picture of a, a triangle, write a triangle. You're not busy analyzing. They are very careful in the remote viewing protocol to separate judgment, i.e. thinking, from intuition. They teach you in remote viewing how to access intuition. Each one of us are psychic. Everyone in this room are psychic. There's not somebody who's more psychic than somebody else or some, less psychic. We're all equally psychic. But some of us listen to the intuition and some of us block it off and think. So the trick is learning to know the difference between thinking and intuition. Now, how do we do that? There's lots of ways to learn how to do it. One of the ways is to A Course in Miracles, to the workbook. After a year, you will start getting intuition. You will know things that you didn't know before. Some will hear the voice, some won't. Some will just know things. Remote viewing is another way to learn how to do it. Another way is just simple meditation. Simple meditation. And when I say meditate, I'm not talking about going to a room and you're going to think about something. <laughs> over and over and over and over and over to go, no, no. No, I'm talking about meditation where you clear your mind of all thoughts. There are no thoughts. No thoughts. And you can get to that point. And I've done it. And I know you can. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's intuition. And really, it's not a voice that's not you. It is you. The voice that talks to you is you. Because there's only one of us here. That's it. There's only oneness. Only oneness. So, questions, comments? Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, could you speak up, please? I can't hear you. Right. Right. So, in other words, saying that from many traditions is by embracing both opposites, you can go from dual to mutual. Because when you embrace both opposites, then there's no conflict. When you separate them, then there is a conflict. Right. Would you, all, would you agree that that would be like accepting both of them? Yeah, acceptance. Right. Both of us, black to the white dog, and white to the black create one. Right. But there are opposites. Well, be careful what you say when you say there are opposites. Is that a belief? Let me let me throw out something to you. Let me let me. And this is, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that if you do some reading and if you ask David and you ask other people, other people that study this kind of thing, you and even scientists, you will find that physical matter does not exist. There is no physical matter. The only way physical matter appears to be real is because of our belief in it. As a matter of fact, our beliefs determine our reality. This is true in every case. Now, what causes our beliefs? And by the way, I'll say beliefs collapse infinite potential into whatever we expect it to be. The scientists are proving this all the time. I mean, there's really no matter in here. This is just a belief. This is a belief, okay? so. I, I say that only to share a, another viewpoint that when you say this is reality, but is it? Is this real? The Course says it's not. The Course and the Law of One both actually say none of this is real. Every bit of this is illusion. It's completely not real. It's an illusion. And it's only held together by our beliefs. Once we change our mind, we change the physical. The physical is not determined by something other than ourselves. We determine what the physical is. And that's kind of a hard 
hard thing because we have been programmed. This is one of the reasons I have come to know that the pyramidal stru power structure is so prevalent on this planet. It, you see it not, not only in religion, but governments, and you see, and they promote the competition model heavily. How many people watch sports? Name me a sports game that is not competitive. Very few. The competition model keeps you thinking there's an us and a them, and there's a me and a you, and there's a win and a lose. That's a subconscious model to keep you thinking that this is all real. But once you get past that, if you're able to let it go and realize that there is a cooperation model, there's a cooperation model. There are sports that are based on cooperation. There is a way to think without thinking there has to be a loser and a winner. The moment you think that there is a winner, then you're stepping into the belief that there's also a loser. Everybody must be the same, and everybody must win, and everybody is the same. In order for you to see that, you must give up your beliefs, this is where I'm back to you, which your, your beliefs that this is real. Okay, and I apologize if I miss you. Okay. Exactly. I agree. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. The Course actually addresses that, and so does the Law of One. This is an experience. It's simply an experience. If you're an eternal, perfect being, and we're going to accept that we are an eternal, perfect being just for this conversation, what is wrong with imagining that you're not? Nothing. And this is simply an imagination. I'm trying to say it's just an experience that we've chosen, and it doesn't affect reality one bit, and it doesn't affect our, our perfection at all. It looks like my time is up. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's the first time this has happened, David. <laughs> thank you so much. We're going to take a... Thank you. We'll take a five-minute break, go ahead and use the restroom, come back, and by that time, David will be ready to go. Thank you so much.